Welcome back to Hey Truck 10. This is where we answer your questions on AWS Cloud Migrations. I'm Cody, the Cloud Engineer, here to answer those questions. Without further ado, let's hear them. Hey Truck 10, what are a few of the best security tools AWS has to offer? Right, so security should always be on everyone's mind when we're talking about even not on the cloud, but especially in the cloud, we need to be very cognizant of how we are securing our applications, our data, whatever it is. We need to make sure it's nice and locked down, uh, locked down tight. There are a number of tools in AWS that can help you out with that. So two of the specific services I really want to mention, there's Security Hub and Guard Duty. So what is Security Hub? So Security Hub essentially gives you a single pane of glass, a nice quick glance at your total security posture in AWS. It can pull together information from all these other security tools I just mentioned and give you a really easy, quick glance at, at what's, what's going on essentially. Amazon Guard Duty is one of the most, arguably, one of the most important tools in AWS, especially when we're talking about security. So what this is going to do is this is going to pour through all of your, essentially, all of your logs. It's going to pour through S3 event logs, VPC flow logs, DNS logs, CloudWatch. It's going to mow through them all. And what it's actually doing is it's analyzing all these logs to try to pick out and find malicious activity. And if it finds something like that, it will alert you. and It'll bring it to your attention so you know right away something iffy is going on. It can bring your attention to it. You can get it resolved as soon as possible. Those are just two of the tools I really want to highlight from our list. Hey, Trek 10. What are some important things to know and help guide my team as we're assessing and adopting cloud-first tools? Okay, another question on tools. So this goes back to the old trope. The first thing you want to think about when you're thinking and going about adopting some cloud-native, cloud-first tool is definitely what's the business case for this? What are you looking to get out of this tool? What's the purpose of wanting to adopt a cloud-native, cloud-first tool? You can identify, you know, sort of key performance indicators that you're wanting to get out of this, uh, this cloud-native, cloud-first tool. Once you have those in mind, that can help guide this, these uh, decisions you're going to be making on these other points I'm going to make. When you're going at this process of looking at a cloud-native tool, it's going to be a little different from on-premise tools. So one of the things you're going to keep in mind is data accessing. How is this data going to be tossed around the cloud? How is it going to get to the users? How are you going to use data for this tool? What data does the tool need? Does it need a whole lot of data? That's going to decide the architecture and the types of tools you want. So if this is data that needs to be really close to the users, you need very, very low latency. You could perhaps think about trying something like CloudFront, putting that behind or in front of the tool, using that integrated into the tool, perhaps if you're architecting this. What CloudFront's going to do is that's going to act like a caching mechanism and keep data very, very close to users for super, super low latency. But when you're looking at these tools related to the data, you have to keep security in the top of your mind. Not only do you have to think about how are your users or even your team, depending on what kind of a tool it is, how are they going to access this tool? You need to think about the IAM permissions, you need to think about the data accesses and the data integrity. How are they going to get data into this? How are they going to get data into the tool securely? Are they going to use SSL? Or is it going to be encrypted? Or perhaps are you doing a hybrid model where this is going to be living on some sort of legacy type NFS system where you could use EFS and mount that on your uh, your, your uh, on-premise server, upload data there just like as normal file share. There's different implications to all of these, but definitely have security on the top of your mind. Think about how you're accessing the data, how you're accessing the tool itself, how the tool is getting access to the data, how you're getting data into the tool, how the tool is getting data out. These are all just some minor points you want to definitely uh, utilize when you're looking at this transition to the cloud-native and cloud-first tool. Hey, Trek 10. We were working with an AWS partner in the assess phase to kick things off, but it didn't go well and we decided to cut ties. Is there a way I can pick up with another AWS partner in the mobilize phase? So for this question, I'm going to have to tap into our local expert on anything business-wise with AWS, uh, Aaron. So Aaron is an account executive here at Track 10. Aaron, can you take this one for me, please? This is a great question. Yes, absolutely. You can work with a different partner during the mobilize phase. There's, there's no, no secret, uh, AWS is no different than other forms of consulting. Sometimes, you know, consultants overpromise. Sometimes they drop the ball altogether. Uh, if that unfortunately happens, you know, in your experience, you can certainly uh, open, open the opportunity up to other partners to bid on that work. Thanks, Aaron. I appreciate it, buddy. That's a good answer. Annie, what do you got? 
Hey, Trek 10. We're hoping to be able to re-host the majority of our applications and data. What's the long-term impact on our workflows and specifically our DevOps team if we go this route? So that's very good. You're thinking about your DevOps team. One of the common pitfalls of a cloud migration is not including your team on this transition. That can cause a lot of disruptions in everybody's workflows. So let's nail down on some major key points on how your workflows, specifically thinking about the DevOps team here, how it can change when you make this transition to the cloud. So one of the first items that is definitely going to be on especially your DevOps team's mind is how are you going to be deploying these new applications, these re-hosted, this re-hosted architecture? How's this all going to work? How's it all going to mesh together? So I'm assuming since you have a DevOps team, they probably already have some sort of CI/CD process, continuous integration, continuous deployment, just a, a way to easily deploy and, and test out code essentially is, is all that is in, in layman's terms. So this DevOps team, they're going to need to think about how they want to go about getting that CI/CD process tied into the cloud now. There's a few different ways to go about that. If you're rehosting the architecture, the application, your software, all of this, you can perhaps think about transitioning the CI/CD itself into the cloud at this time as well. If you're rehosting that, then deployments can become slightly easier perhaps. AWS does offer a suite of tools you can utilize for a CI/CD process. There's a, a big ones like code commit, which can replace some sort of like Git based source control for software. Another thing that's big for that is also source control for infrastructure as code as well. Whether that's Terraform, CloudFormation, the list can go on. As long as it's stored in Git, you can store it in code commit. From there, there's also code build, which can build your code. You can use that to not only build a code, you can use it to test your code, run unit tests, run integration tests. You can do a lot of code build. You can do a lot with code. It's, it's a pretty useful tool. Your DevOps team will definitely be interested in that one as well. There's also code deploy, which can automatically deploy change sets. It can automatically deploy entire CloudFormation templates. It can deploy certain things, really, literally, pretty much anything you want, it can deploy it, as long as you have it all configured correctly. Your DevOps team is going to be super interested in that. You can tie all these together with something like Code Pipeline. That's also going to be another tool very, very much so on the mind of your DevOps team. They're going to be interested in learning more about that and how they can leverage Code Pipeline to use all those previous tools I just mentioned to automatically test and deploy your application all in one seamless action, essentially. You can have manual gates, you know, set up something like a dev environment, set up a test environment, staging, set up a production environment, and your, your DevOps team can leverage all of that to have your application uh, run better at the end of the day. Oh, I want to work in data. Besides CI/CD type stuff and, and deployments of your application, something else is going to change with your workflows is perhaps how you develop these items, how you develop your code, your application. If this is going to be hosted on the clouds, this is now, you can think about it, a cloud native or cloud first uh, application. You can use certain tools like Cloud9 or even use CodeStar connections to actually develop and, and utilize your code, uh, rapid testing, rapid development. That's another item that's going to be very interesting to your DevOps team. You can also need to let your DevOps team be aware of the fact that data handling is going to be different now. Preferably, all the data is going to be handled and protected through like IAM access. So perhaps you have data in S3, only certain roles, certain members get access to certain data. Perhaps you have data in, in some sort of database, like some RDS, you have it in DynamoDB. You're using Redshift as a data warehouse to analyze your data, something like that. Most of this can be controlled through IAM access and privileges. So you definitely want to make sure your DevOps team is aware of how to essentially log in and authenticate with AWS to not hinder their job duties. There are several different predefined job duty type roles you can leverage that AWS creates that you can just hand off to your DevOps team and, and they can run through and, and assume whatever role they need to get data access to whatever they need to use. They need to get uh, access to whatever the application is, they need to deploy it. So essentially it's going to boil down to everything changes in the workflow, but it changes for the better. You need to remember there is always data accessing uh, can change, the workflow of actually uh, real deployment changes, and just how your DevOps team will log into the environment and use it is definitely going to change. Your AWS partner you're working with for this migration process is definitely going to be able to help guide you on whatever your team needs during this entire process. They can help your team learn whatever these new workflows are, and they can help guide you on letting your team know what decisions to make for these new workflows, how to help best facilitate your use of AWS in general.
Thanks for joining us today. I'm Cody. This is Hey Trek 10. Keep on sending us questions, we'll keep on answering them. If you want to learn more about us, check out our migration page, it's right up here.